Hey everyone, Russ of Aquamax hey. here. I'm here with Tristan, invertebrate dude. Really excited to have you all here. Uh, welcome to everyone who's already in the chat. We've got quite a few viewers already and uh, welcome to those of you who are catching the replay. So I want to turn the time over to invertebrate dude to introduce himself a little bit. Hey, hi, so I'm invertebrate dude. Uh, also known as sister dude on the forums, TJ on Brown on Facebook. Um, uh, but my thing is keeping invertebrates, natives, exotics, uh, mostly focused on detritivores like uh, roaches and, you know, uh, camel crickets, darkling beetles, isopods, that sort of thing. Uh, but I've also kept some predatory invertebrates as well and just a, a wide variety of invertebrates, but with a focus on exotic cockroaches, I should say. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just read them and share my experiences with them online, write care sheets for things that I've successfully bred and just try to stay active in the community and help people breed their stuff too. So that's kind of awesome. my thing. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's been, uh, I've been following the things you're doing online for quite a while now. And Thank you. How, how long have you been in the hobby? It's been a, it's been a while. Well, I've been obsessed with bugs, like, from a very young age. Um, but when I really started to get into breeding invertebrates, especially, like, exotic ones, um, probably 2015 is really when I got my start. It's when I started my blog, too, actually. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, yeah. So. But, yeah. but it was a couple of years before that, I bred various native invertebrates, and just catch it, tried to catch everything I could. Uh, mm -hmm. outside and tried to keep them in good practice for keeping, you know, exotics and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's very cool. I, I uh, feel like we, we kind of had a similar beginning cause I was doing yeah. that too. <laughs> when I was, <laughs> yeah. when I was a, a little kid, I was catching the bugs and bringing them inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. Wilson Forrest would like to know what you got, what got you started specifically on cockroaches? I don't know. <laughs> it just, when I was young, I for some reason had a fascination with the pest roaches. Mm -hmm. And I, they've just always been my favorite insect for some reason, roaches in general. And then I found out about hissers and that people kept them as pets when I was like 10. And I was like, oh, I have to have those. I have to have those. And uh, my grandpa, one of my grandpas gave me a hissing cockroach as a pet as a gift one day. <laughs> and uh, from there, it was just, you know, over the years, I started collecting more and more. And, uh, roaches are just so diverse and easy to care for, most of them. Hmm. And, you know, they just, they're just really, really interesting invertebrates, really misunderstood. And yeah. I just love them for some reason. And, yeah. Cool. Uh, that's, that's, I, I have to agree with you there. They're, they're very misunderstood and quite mm -hmm. fascinating. I used to work with hissers at the zoo in the mm -hmm. educational collection, and I just thought they were the greatest thing. They were yeah. So, yeah. so easy to handle. They intrigued a lot of people. They disgusted a lot of people, but my job was to try to help them be more intrigued and less disgusted. And yeah. usually I could, could succeed once they saw what they really were. It was it was easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Cool. So, oh, yeah. Arthur Pot Ambassadors is here. Super excited hey. for the live stream. She says, you are on fire as far as recent invites. I have to agree. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. This has been it's been a really yeah. great uh, time for that. Yeah, it was fun last week watching Roach Crossing. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, that was very fun. Mm -hmm. um, Wilson also <laughs> asks, any recommendations for a Florida beetle owner? So beetles that you hmm. can keep in Florida? Well, you have a you have neat species there, uh, including uh, you, if you have been seeing the thumbnail for this uh, live stream, you're probably familiar with the, the Pyrophorus noctilucus, the giant Ecuadorian, well, Central American, uh, Central South American, <laughs> a bioluminescent click beetle. Um, but there are three, three species in two genera in Florida that are very closely related, smaller, but still bioluminescent. They look mm. pretty much just like dwarf pyrophorus. And I actually have a species from Florida 
from Ocala, Florida, uh, Delia Later Atlanticus. Oh, uh, awesome. friend, yeah, Alan John caught those um, and sent them to me, which is nice. But oh, yeah. those are bioluminescent, you know, glow very, very brightly. I think that Power Force Noctilucus, at least, is has the brightest bioluminescence of any invertebrate. That um, is awesome. So, yeah, yeah, very bright. Um, so they have several species in Florida. Kind of small, but so far it seems to be identical in care mm -hmm. compared to Power Force. So those would be a definitely a neat addition to any collection, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, Ah, I'm trying to think what else they got in Florida. They have a few darkling beetles. You can find superworms in the wild in Florida. In really? some spots. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm mostly familiar with the roach fauna of Florida, the beetle mm -hmm. fauna, not so much. Okay. Um, and I don't actually know if exotic, like not exotic, but the species like Dynasties tidius uh, are restricted in Florida or not. Uh, good um, question. A lot yeah. of things are, so. Yeah. I think probably most darkling beetles aren't, though. So, you know, blue death painting beetles, the various aloidy species, those would be good picks, too. No, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, now that we're talking about the the bioluminescent click beetles, which is mm -hmm. one, that's something I want to keep someday. I, they're just so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we see the one that you have, the, the larva that you yeah. have? Yeah. So, unfortunately, as I was telling Russ here before the stream, I don't have any uh, adults right now because adults only live about four to five months on average. And mine matured, uh, you know, summer last year. So, yeah. they were, I think all of them were dead by December. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do still have some large larvae that, uh, yeah, actually, I can show off on the macro screen here. Yeah. Okay, let me put, put there, that in the screen yeah, yeah. and put it on solo mode. There we go. Yeah. So this is a large Pyroforce Noctilucus larva that is trying to bite me. Ah, okay, that hurt. Oh, ah. he's got a good grip on you there. Yeah, yeah, good grip. Ouch. Yeah, so these are... This is the larva of a Pyrophorus noctilucus. They are, oh, yeah, okay. Well, they're really large and um, take about, I think, a, a year to a year and a half to mature on average. Usually the longer it takes, the bigger the adult you'll get. And the adults mm -hmm. can get like, you know, one and a half, two inches long. A nice uh, and big beetle. The, yeah, the larvae get longer. They lose length and a little bit of mass when they mature. Um, but, oh, he's going to try to bite me again. They, they vomit this weird black fluid when they try to bite you. I don't know what that is. Like, just vomit. Uh, hmm. But it can make you think, oh, my God, I'm bleeding <laughs> when they're biting you. But, oh, oh, yeah. I haven't had that happen yet. Okay, now he's biting my foot. Okay, oh. this is this is going well. <laughs> Ow! Okay, no, no. yeah. I in case you don't, in case you can't tell, I don't normally hold these as larva. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are the adults? <laughs> They're really aggressive. As the, as no, adults, adults can't as... bite. Okay. Adults can't bite. Adults are herbivores. They only eat fruits and veggies. These guys, the larva, are predatory. Mm -hmm. They'll eat, they'll accept dog food in captivity, but they will also go after live prey like mealworms, uh, incapacitated okay. crickets, probably. Anything that they can grab a hold of in their tunnels, they'll, uh, they will rip to shreds. <laughs> wow. So, and, uh, do they, um, yeah, so I'm, oh, I'm not going to pick this one up anymore. Okay. Looks like we lost the, the macro stream for some reason. Oh, it's coming back. Oh. Here it is. Okay. C coming back. There it goes. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. The uh, are the larvae bioluminescent as well? They have a, a spot behind their head, so like right there behind mm -hmm. the head. If you sufficiently disturb them, they can glow. I've only ever seen it on very small, like tiny larvae. Uh, oh, I've okay. never seen it on big ones. 
but okay. they have a bright blue bioluminescence when disturbed, uh, at least a small larva. And cool. pupa are fully bioluminescent. All the time, the whole yeah, process of creation. Yeah. Like <laughs> if, you, so cool. if, if you touch them or like disturb the deli cup they're in, they'll just start wiggling around and glowing like crazy. So oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. That is very cool. And so, supposedly the eggs are bioluminescent too, but I've never seen any click beetle eggs of any species I've bred. So uh, that doesn't, I have not, I've not been able to see that, but oh, okay. that's pretty cool. That is cool. So Vince wants to know mm -hmm. if we can see your, the ones you collected or the ones that were collected by Alan in Florida. Uh, I don't have them here right now. The biggest ones are like that long mm -hmm. and look identical to the one you just saw, oh, okay. just on a smaller scale. But you don't have, I any, don't adults. have any adults right now. Okay. So so just larvae. Okay. Yeah. Frank the Tank wants to know if uh, mm -hmm. he says, do they have bacteria that help them glow, or do they use a chemical reaction? Uh, no, they uh, they do not have any bacteria symb symbiotic relationships. Uh, they just glow themselves like fireflies. Okay. Um, some sort of chemical mixture, I guess, in them, so but. Uh, Probably yeah. like the luciferin luciferase reaction in uh, yeah. fireflies. Yeah. But the uh, beetles, the click beetles, seem to be more uh, constant, right? I mean, they have those two spots, the glow spots on their back that are always glowing. Is that right? Uh, yes. The well, no. The click beetles can actually turn the lights on and off. Oh, they can. Okay. Yeah. When they're resting, they're usually off. But when they go out to wander at night, or when they're picked up or disturbed, then they'll glow. Okay. But it seems and, to be once they turn on, they stay on for longer than say most fireflies, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because like okay. when they go out wandering at night, they're not like constantly blinking the light on and off like fireflies often mm -hmm. will. Uh, they just glow the whole time, very brightly. And it's hmm. it's when they're flying around at night, because um, adults can fly very well. Uh, it just looks like trails of green light, you know. Oh, that's so it, it cool. Kind of trails behind them. It's really cool. Yeah. I wish I had seen that when I was in Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you go to like uh, Okala, certain parts of Okala, um, maybe down in the Keys, uh, Archbold Biological Station, you know, during the summer months. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was can, what was uh, going on. You can find them there. Yeah, I was there in October, so it was a little late, I guess, for that. Yeah, that's that's probably a little too late for the alone. And yeah. this, this, by the way, in the background is just a Asian clown roach, Hemisocera vitata. It's I can't take these out of their enclosure. They're very good flyers and very great climbers. Uh, so I don't don't want to open this, but uh, there is one on the side of the tank here that you can kind of see. Yeah, very yeah, I can pretty. see the colors on it. Even, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going in and out of focus a little bit, but the colors are really nice on that. Yeah, yeah. They're actually uh, supposedly wasp mimics, and they move in a very stuttery motion like wasps, wave around their antenna like wasps. Uh, oh, yeah. Very cool. Diurnal pollen feeders mostly actually feed them. Ugh artificial pollen and uh, chickpea, as well as oh. apple. Cool. What do you put in the artificial uh, pollen? Or do you make that or do you buy it's, it? I buy it. It's B-Pro brand uh, artificial pollen. I guess they sell it for like feeding bees during the winter when there's no flowers out. Oh, cool. But it works well for a variety <laughs> of roses. I should try that for my velvet ants and see if they want any. That might be yeah, they might like that. Yeah. yeah. But That's yeah, these cool. are cool. These are, I'm the only one in the U.S. with these currently. Uh, that hopefully so that cool. will change soon. So, because they're very pretty. Are you uh, just waiting for them to start breeding or? Yep. I got two adult females and one adult male. Nice. And a sub adult female. So, should have tons of babies soon. It's interesting. The hatchlings are actually ant mimics. They're shaped oh. like ants. They look like they have, you know, three main, uh, you know, clumps, little body segments. You know how ants look. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. 
and then they go on to be more flat, kind of roach looking, but have beautiful patterning of black and red and white, a little bit of blue to them too, in person at least. Mm -hmm. um, very prettily patterned. I don't uh, know what so they're trying to mimic, but uh, yeah, very pretty. Uh, it could even be just some posematic coloration, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, might be. But, so, uh, yeah. Arthropod Ambassadors is asking, now that we're talking about roaches and ants, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to know if we you had any details to share about those roaches that cohab with ants. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't know what to focus this on, by the way, anyway. <laughs> but... Uh, the uh, ant roaches. There are a couple different types. Uh, I have Compsodes schwartzi, which is uh, one of the more popular microfeeders in the hobby right now, found mm -hmm. in Arizona and some neighboring states. Uh, they, they live symbiotically with a variety of ants, but I believe the ones in the hobby were found with trap jaw ants. And they just seem to be simple scavengers. You know, they eat the ants through fuse, um, move really quickly so that the ants can't catch them. <laughs> uh, but then there are some more specialized species. I have one that I'm kind of failing to breed, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, my my Mecklebata uh, no, wheelary, which uh, current stock is from Florida, but they're found in some of the neighboring states as well. Mm -hmm. But they're like flat, round roaches that are usually found with Campanotus ants, oh. uh, you know, the wood ants and mm -hmm. the carpenter ants. <laughs> and okay. they uh, are found in the galleries. Um, and I think their main defense is just being so flat that they'll just suction themselves up against like the tunnel walls mm -hmm. and the ants can't like scrape them off. They can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and they are also just basic detritivores, maybe fungivores, uh, you know, eating fungus and, you know, ant refuse, frass, mm -hmm. who knows. Um, but, so, and then there's another species that is not in the hobby that's found in association with uh, leafcutter ants. Oh, wow. Uh, Adaphila fungicola, actually the smallest roach in the world. I think adults max out at like a millimeter. Really? So very small. Yeah, yeah. And they feed, supposedly only feed on the fungus that the ants grow <laughs> in their wow. underground fungus chambers, you know. Uh, and it's interesting because they only live in leafcutter ant nests, So, and but the adults have no wings. They're just these round, wingless uh, circles. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so when it comes time for the ants to have their nuptial flights, <clears throat> the roaches will attach themselves to the winged elates of the ants and just be carried away to the new colony. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, that's how they disperse. That's so, amazing. Yeah, those are cool. And found in some parts of the U.S., uh, Texas, Louisiana, maybe New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, Usually found with at a at a uh, tech census, I think is the name. The the dominant ant leaf cutter ant species in Texas. Okay. But uh, yeah, but they're very rarely seen because the only way you'll see them is if you dig up a leaf cutter ant fungal garden, or okay. if you find a lates with that roaches attached to them. Okay. So. And yeah. if they only feed on that fungus, I wonder if that's a if that's an obligate food, if they can survive without it, that would be interesting to find yeah, out. Yeah, they, yeah, they pr probably can only survive on that fungus, but maybe, maybe they'd survive on other stuff as well. No, well, that's amazing that they're so specialized. It would be a nice experiment to see. Mm -hmm. So yeah. someone... Someone asked but, uh, uh, yeah. if you keep hermit crabs. No, I used to really want to. But in general, I don't like breeding things. I don't like keeping things that I can't breed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that makes sense. I know that uh, there's am there I cutting a few out? people that are a little bit. Cut out a little bit for a second. But I think you're fine now. Oh, oh okay. 
Okay. Yeah, I there's actually people uh, uh, captive breeding right. hermit crabs finally, but it's been a long time in coming and it's still not that yeah. widespread. So. Yeah, yeah, because they have the, those planktonic early stages. It's really hard to, to care for them. Yeah, that's true. So Jen wants to know if you have any dairy cow isopods or powder orange. Uh, no, I do not have dairy cows uh, or powder oranges. I used to keep uh, just the wild type form of Porcelionides prunosus, just the powder blues. Mm -hmm. but I do not have, I've never had any of the morphs. I, I don't have the only isopod species I have right now are dwarf whites. Okay. Used to have more, but back in 2018, I got rid of most of my collection. Mm -hmm. And so I've not reacquired any of the isopods I used to keep. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I used to have the uh, regular powder blues, but mm -hmm. none of the orange ones, but they look really pretty. They do. Oh, pretty cool. So, have you ever encountered the? Uh, did you encounter the pied form of Silisticus convexus back in the day? Yes, I did. I think I was one of the first to report that morph. That's what I was thinking. Up in their colonies, yeah. Yeah. But oddly, it could not be isolated. That's that's what I, I was recalling. I, yeah, I isolated them, and I sent some to Alan Gross who was one of the bigger isopod keepers back in the day. Yeah. And he wasn't able to isolate them either. They just produce normal offspring. So Yeah, that's what I heard. I don't and know I think why. It was, yeah, I think uh, Oren McMonagall got hold of some of them and had the same thing. Couldn't get him mm -hmm. to isolate. Yeah. 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 But supposedly there's a Ukrainian strain of pied Silisticus convexus that breeds true. Yeah, so, I have that strain. Interesting. Now. Yeah. And it, yeah, that's worth, cool. It's it, yeah. it does seem to be true. I've got the first uh, juveniles from it, and they're coming. They mm -hmm. look by it, so it's working. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. But yeah, it's really weird that the U.S. ones did not were not true breeding. I don't know what that was. Yeah, some sort of I, environmental I, thing. I don't know. I've seen it too because I tried to isolate a strain from my powder blues that did a similar mm -hmm. thing. It wasn't breeding mm -hmm. true, at least not yeah. consistently. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's weird that. When I removed all the pieds from my main colony, I stopped getting mm. pieds popping up. So I wonder if they need to mate with normal ones in order to get offspring that exhibit that trait. Uh, could be. Maybe. Could be. But, That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I would love to see some of your uh, your camel crickets that you have for us. Today. Okay. All righty. Well... Here we go. Let me just get them out over here. Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Okay, you can use the macros camera now. Okay, let me pop that into the stream. Here we go. And I see, I see Alan's in the stream. Alan's in, uh, Alan John. Oh, there he he's is, yeah. The one, he's the one who caught these. Theothophilus gracilipes gracilipes. Uh, giant uh, camel cricket from Montgomery, Alabama, although these are widespread in the East Coast, but they are absolutely massive camel crickets. And, yeah, uh, that, is, that is one oops, big camel cricket. The, he is, she is all the way around. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Wrong side of my arm, but uh, they are... She, she was being more calm earlier, and that's Difficult to get her to stay still, but they are enormous and easy to keep. A little, a little cannibalistic. They seem to really like insect protein. Mm -hmm. She just like, jumped. What kind of insect protein <laughs> do you offer them? Uh, Pre-killed mealworms. Oh, okay. I say mealworms. But I use Eloides larva, which are like 10 times the size of a normal mealworm. Yeah, so like... And a, they just rip them up. What, what kind of Eloides do you use? Uh, Eloides obscura salsipinus, because those are what I have the most of. <laughs> okay. But uh, that, yeah, giant Eloides for giant crickets. Yeah, 
I love that yeah, species. Yeah. I have I have Eliodis obscura too, and it's uh, one of my favorite darkling beetles. They're so active. Yeah, I have a several larvae that are about to pupate. It's oh, it's been awesome. a long time coming. Uh, but uh, yeah, these guys are massive for camel crickets. And I wanted yeah. to show that I have a, a native Idaho species here as well. Hold on, there you go. So that that's like the size of a normal camel cricket adult. Most species that I've seen average around that size. And then this is just a behemoth of yeah. a camel cricket. That and is the is, word yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely the word for it. Um, yeah, trying to get them... Side by side here. Ah, there you go. Oh, perfect. So like, yeah. yeah. Got a good Just shot of it there. The size difference is uh, kind of crazy. And she, this one is being very antsy right now. Um, but yeah, so these have been laying eggs for me now, so I should have tons of babies soon. Cool. Going to be, so, if anyone wants them, they're going to be a freaking pain to pack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I can but, imagine. Yeah. How, how many, how, uh, <laughs> do they produce a lot of eggs at once? Yeah, they, they, once they've been mated, they just seem to lay eggs uh, continuously till they die. Oh, wow. And they have a lot of eggs per cricket. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the females was actually cannibalized upon recently, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a bummer, but I've got four females still. Okay. Uh, but when she was dead, I could see that her basically her entire abdomen was just full of eggs. Wow. So, and they have, you know, pretty chunky abdomen. So, yeah. So do you think these have any potential as a feeder beyond pets just because they're so uh, big? Well, larger ones kind of have a bite to them. Mm, like, okay. so I wouldn't necessarily feed them. I feed this species. I use this species as feeders for my tarantula. Mm -hmm. My rose hair tarantula. She pretty much the only thing she'll eat because she only eats cricket shaped things. She refuses to eat roaches. So mm. smaller nymphs of this species could probably be used as feeders. And like a large adult like this could be used for like a, a reptile probably. Like the a large thick skin, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, for other invertebrates and stuff, I'd be a little wary just because they can bite if that they need sense. to. So. Makes sense. But, so, yeah. uh, Connor Terry is asking if you have phasmids. No, I don't. Those are too, too risky, too illegal. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, also too high maintenance. I don't like things that need to eat live plants. It's just my personal preference. Too much work, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like these these don't need live plants. Uh, like a lot of grasshoppers and stuff do. They just mm -hmm. they predominantly eat protein. Okay, so their main diet is the beetle larvae that you give them, and yeah, dog food and then beetle larvae occasionally just to keep them extra fed oh, okay uh, so, and then they'll, they'll also eat like fruits and vegetables and stuff but just mm -hmm. not with nearly as much vigor as they do the protein-based food so, okay so yeah. omnivorous but with a tendency toward more proteinaceous food. yeah 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 makes sense so yeah very cool okay so <laughs> have you ever worked with velvet ants I did. I had uh, last year. I caught a bunch here in Idaho. I found a bunch, and most of them died <laughs> very quickly. Huh. I I just tried feeding them fruits. I think I was supposed to give them nectar. I'd never tried keeping velvet ants before. Mm -hmm. um, it might also have been that the sand I was using. I was just using plain sand for them for the substrate, maybe that was too abrasive. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, they, I've had, uh, you know, when I first started keeping velvet ants, my first ones lasted about six months, I think, and then I had some that lasted only a week or something. And I have found that the nectar really helps because they do dehydrate faster than people would think. 
and that that has helped me mm -hmm. um, just making sure there's always nectar yeah. available but yeah and even yeah. even with that though occasional ones will come in and then just die after a few days so it's kind of tricky and then yeah. of course you don't know their lifespan since they're wild caught they're not really breedable in captivity yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but so no, I I I tried keeping them once, and it was very unsuccessful. So I am not feeling ready to try again anytime soon. I feel bad for those ones that die. Yeah, I I, so, I understand. Yeah, um, yeah most of them. Detritivores, more up my alley. Yeah, detritivores. I I love them. They're great. Mm -hmm. And like Alan says, velvetants need ground dwelling wasps. They parasitize them. And so that's pretty hard to uh, replicate in captivity. Oh, yeah. You can't breed them. Like, I, no one's ever bred velvetants successfully yeah. because of the parrot, because they're parasites. So yeah. it's hard. But they make nice pets for people that actually know how to keep them. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I'm not one of those people. Oh, let, let's uh, have you introduce us to this beauty here. Yeah, this is Elliptorina davidi, uh, the bumpy hisser, probably the rarest hisser in the hobby, because they're prone to random mass die-offs for some reason. Huh. But uh, they're very cool. This is an adult male, a very well-fed adult male. He's very... Uh, Almost bloated, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I just fed them banana recently, and they kind of gorge themselves on that. So, <laughs> but uh, he he can see on the pronotum just a little bit, covered in little bumps. Mm -hmm. uh, and on nymphs and females, the entire body is covered in those tubercles, but adult males kind of lose that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But so that's why they're called bumpy hisses because they're just completely covered in tubercles. Um, oh, that's cool. So really interesting. The coloration yeah. is very neat on them. And uh, it is a hissing roach, one of the dwarf hissing roaches, but one of the larger dwarfs. Mm -hmm. And let me see if I can get it to hiss. But, uh, oh. oh, let me change the... I'm going to open the camera here. Yeah. Okay, let's uh. try it. He still want to hiss. Uh, let me see. That's weird. That's so weird. When I was pulling him out of his container, he was hissing like crazy. So. Is he just hissed out? <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe sitting out here where it's a little bit colder, he might not be uh, uh, able to hiss. Sense. Yeah, in the cool. Was... They they like it pretty warm, especially compared to other hissers. Mm -hmm. um, they like it pretty, pretty warm. So, cool. and I am holding this camera in a very weird way. So let me just. Okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, that there comes there. up pretty nicely right there. Yeah. They, their body seems almost like it's a little bit more elongate than uh, some of the other mm -hmm. hissers. That's normal for Elliptorina. Uh -huh. which is the genus that this hisser belongs to. Most common hissers in the hobby uh, belong to Gromphodorhina. Uh -huh. So, like, the normal hissers are Gromphodorhina portentosa, and wide-horn hissers are Gromphodorhina obliganata, and tiger hissers were considered to be Gromphodorhina grandidieri, but they're not uh, wild Gromphodorhina uh, wild Gromphodorina grandidieri look nothing like the tigers in the hobby. And okay. so our tigers are probably Princessia van Werebecki, a, a distinct form or maybe new subspecies of that species. Uh, but then there are some who doubt Princessia is even a valid genus and should be a synonym of Gromphodorina. So close enough. <laughs> yeah. Nice. But, uh, yeah, these belong to Elliptorina, these uh, bumpy hissers. Same as uh, Elliptorina javanica, which is the Halloween hisser, one of the more oh. popular hissers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Elliptorina chopardi, the, the generic dwarf hisser. And Elliptorina levigata, the V-horn hisser, which is 
a very pretty, very large Elliptorina species that I've never kept, but hope to one day. Cool. So, yeah. so these are these are cool. Hopefully, they are. they're becoming a little bit more common in the hobby because people have been breeding them successfully the past couple mm -hmm. of years in the U.S. So hopefully, we'll see more of them. Yeah. But, uh, Heather, yeah. Heather Jensen is asking if domino roaches are ever used as feeders. Yes, occasionally. I was just talking to someone about this on the arachnoboards. But, uh, yeah, there's actually an article in the American Cockroach Society publication number two about rearing Theria as feeders. And Theria is the genus of domino and question mark roaches. But, uh, yeah, they, they take about a year to mature, though that can sped up to eight months if you feed them lots of protein and keep them about 88 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, and the oots take about three to four months to hatch as well. So kind of a long developmental period, but they make up for that in producing tons of babies. Like, oh, okay. you start with a starter culture of 12, and from that 12, you can easily get, like, one to 200 babies. If you oh, do wow. This properly. Yeah. So yeah. they can be very prolific and thus can make great feeders, even though they take so long to grow and uh, breed. So Because then you have uh, a good size range of offspring to use as feeders. and. Exactly. You have so many growing so slowly that they're stable for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Only thing is nymphs burrow most of the time and look like little walking clumps of dirt. So you'd have to use them as feeders for either something that burrows and pursues burrowing prey or put them in a food bowl or something. Ah, mm -hmm. that makes because, sense. you know, they will escape from their predators by burrowing if need be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. But, uh, let me see the chat here. Uh, hissing cockroach. Yes, this is a uh, Elliptorina davidi. Bumpy hisser. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That, that's it's really cool to see. There's so many different species of hissers out there with variations. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's like uh, 20, 30 species wow. of hissers total. But very few of those are in the hobby. Uh, mm. Only about a dozen, I think. Maybe 20. I'm not sure. I haven't. I know. I don't, ha I don't have the number memorized. But I know most of the species in the hobby. Yeah, I've been so, getting more into hissers recently. Uh, trying to help figure out the genetics of some of them and, you know, how to tell hybrids from purebreds and stuff. Because we do have a hybrid problem in the hobby with hissers. But, yeah, that's what I hear. Mm -hmm. So, let's see. Um, Maxwell is asking, what's the best cockroach? Um, as a pet <laughs> and the best one as a feeder. Uh, best one feeder. It, it, it that's you can't you can't have one best because there are multiple different types of predators and different types of roaches will make better feeders for different predators than others. So like Blaptica dubia is probably one of the most frequently bred feeder species. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very bulky and they burrow. So they don't make the best of feeders for like mantids, example, for example. Like they, they'll never come up to the mantids to feed. Uh, okay. Whereas a species like Hemithrocera palliata, uh, the pallid sun roach, uh, those are basically like flies. <laughs> like adults can fly and all ages are very thin shelled climb well, are diurnal, and will climb up to the mantids for them to feed. Uh, and they're super oh, prolific, nice. too. 
Um, cool. So, like, I have a colony. I started with, like, 20 in uh, November. And I mm-hmm. probably have uh, 100, maybe 150 tiny nymphs in oh, there yeah. right now. So, mm-hmm. very fast to breed and very prolific. But they're small. So those wouldn't be good for, like, a Gramostola tarantula, you know? A yeah, dubia just... would be better for that. Um, so it all depends what you're feeding. That makes uh, sense. But as for a pet, that's also kind of subjective. Do you want something you can handle? If that's the case, maybe a hisser or a, a blabberous species, something like that. Uh, but if you want something that's super pretty, just to look at, like a display species, then maybe a Hemithrocera species or a Pseudoglomerus magnifica, if you can afford them, the emerald gro- emerald roaches. Oh, people were asking about emerald yeah. roaches. Do you have any of those? Yeah, I don't. I have a species that's probably the same species, but it could be a different subspecies. Pseudoglomerus CF magnifica gold china uh, whereas the green ones in the hobby come from vietnam okay uh, but the gold ones have some behavioral differences they're also noticeably smaller than the green ones uh, and they're gold <laughs> so cool. there's some debate as to whether or not they're actually magnifica but so the gold I ones, do have are those they, are they like a metallic gold Color? They're metallic bronzish gold. Wow, yeah. that's pretty cool. So very interesting. Unfortunately, the colony I received was infected with a entomophagus fungus. Oh, so no. I lost the most of them due to that. But I think I've cured them of it. So I still have three females. Probably gonna send those to my friend Brandon Main. Of Magnificent Beasts, because I think he's the only one in U.S. that still has a male nymph. So, oh, okay. And he has extensive experience with Pseudoglomerus Magnifica. So he'll be able to get those breeding. But I cool. just want to make sure they're completely fungus-free. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So Alan, Alan John wants to know if we can see your Arena Vaga set up. Oh, okay. I didn't have those out here, but I can show him that. Ugh, let me get this. It's basically, it's very simple. Uh, here, I will leave this staring at the... Uh, can I get this out? Okay. Oh, we lost your audio for a second, but you're back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that the phone disconnected for some reason. Um, but uh, here, I will take you to where Aaron and Vaga are in my closet. Um, am I still connected? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, this out. All right, so let me just this, get the camera back up. All right, and I'll get the macro back on here. But it's basically, this is a 16 ounce container with uh, coconut fiber as a substrate. It's actually used coconut, coconut fiber from my uh, old gyna culture. So it's very, uh, very uh, down. It's a very fine substrate because they're usually found in rodent burrows where the, the bottom of the burrows are like a light, duffy substrate. Mm-hmm. So this is, and then the leaf litter on top because that's mostly what they eat. Um, decaying organic vegetation but so it's hard to see here but the top layer of substrate is really dry bone dry and 
this, I would say this entire side here is bone dried to the bottom. Whereas on the other side, actually it's the other way around. This side is bone dried. This side is humid for the bottom, uh, I would say half an inch. It, the substrate's only like an inch high in here because it's a very small Aranavagi starter culture. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you can actually see here, this is one of the uh, Aranavaga Florensis white. Mm. And it's, there you go. Oh, there. We got some more light. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's a species native to Florida, as you may guess. Uh, and usually found in like light white sand. Mm -hmm. So they blend in very well with sand. Not fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So it makes them easy to monitor yeah, using definitely. cone fiber. But that's, uh, that's so, breaking. yeah, that's essentially my Vaga setup. It's uh, very well uh, ventilated, pen painstakingly ventilated with a soldering iron, all these little <laughs> pinholes, and a billion more on the lid. Oh, yeah. Because uh, yeah, they're prone to fungal infections if they're moderately ventilated. They need to be yeah. very well ventilated. Um, and then I just chuck in some chick feed or dog food or whatever in the dry corner every few days and then replace. And just because they grow faster with protein present in the diet. But Makes sense. Uh, most of what they eat is probably just the leaf litter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. and uh, I've been keeping these at around uh, 75 Fahrenheit, and they're doing pretty well. Cool. I have these, and then I have the dark form of Aranavaga biana, which is the largest Aranavaga species, uh, I think, even worldwide. Uh, wow. So, those are nice, but uh, both of which were sent by Alan. So, nice. shout out for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was that speaking of that. Aaron of August, I know. Very cool. And Alan, I wanted to say that the uh, the whiteout uh, armadillidium nizatum you sent me are doing really well and producing lots of babies. So thank you for those. Um, yes. Supreme Gecko says, keeping roaches in general, what is the number one issue people get wrong about their care? Uh, oh, he says, uh, with roaches, what is the number one issue people get wrong about their care? Okay. Um, I would say a lot of people just don't keep their roaches warm enough. Uh, a lot of the species in the hobby don't breed well if kept under 75 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. That's an issue. Um, no, it, most most people who try to breed roaches succeed, at least with the most commonly available species in the hobby. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of hard to go wrong with them. Uh, maybe a lot of people try to feed them human foods, like leftover pizza and stuff, and I wouldn't <laughs> recommend that. It's not very healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally, you want to be feeding them like fresh fruits and vegetables and cheap dog food or, or oatmeal or whatever you want to use for protein. Um, just not stuff that's high in like preservatives and sugars and stuff like that, like artificial sugar. Um, yeah. Because that can be detrimental to their health. Okay. Uh, there's some better footage of that. Uh, oh, look at those colors. Yeah, that's showing up. Yeah. Very, very pretty. Probably the prettiest roach in my collection right now. And that's the Asian clown roach? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very the Mr. cool. Mr. Sarah Vitata. Yeah. Very, very cool. 
So Arthropod Ambassadors has a couple of questions. She asks, mm -hmm. um, have you experienced uh, like breathing issues? It says that hissers bother her nose. Um, yeah. When she's even trying to keep them clean, it just bugs her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm actually allergic to hissers. Uh, I okay. used to have a big hybrid Grumpfordarhina colony. And my eyes would like welt a little bit and uh, I would start sneezing when I do maintenance on them. Uh, mm -hmm. So then I got rid of them. But now I want to get into the rarer hisser species and trying to keep pure lines alive in the hobby. So I'm getting back into hissers despite that. Uh, it, having cleaner crews in there, like springtails and stuff, really helps. Uh, also, some species of hissers like more humidity than others, and those are easier to keep, I found, because it's the dry, dusty substrate that when disturbed, like, gets dispersed into the air and can cause the nasal issues for those of us allergic to hissers. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a more humid setup prevents that, but some species don't like it that humid, so you got to do some research on which ones do. Um, okay. So, and then other than that, like, you just screwed. <laughs> like, once I <laughs> once I start building up numbers of these, like, uh, the bumper hi bumpy hissers, uh, I'm going to, it's going to be pretty painful doing maintenance on them because <laughs> they like it really dry, and the more of them that f create frass and stuff, it's just going to be more of a nightmare. So might have to wear plastic gloves, maybe a face mask while doing maintenance. I know some people have to do that. But yeah, it's well, just kind of unfortunate. There's not much you can do once you become allergic to hissers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just kind of unlucky. Some people get allergic to their hissers, some don't. And unfortunately, I'm one of the ones that did become allergic to hissers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's not a ton of advice I can provide for that. Okay. Most people, if it gets bad enough, they just stop keeping his. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and I will say that when I was really bad with the hissers, I was also experiencing uh, allergic reactions to the other roach species I was keeping. But once I got rid of the hissers, those effects went away with the other species. Like, I could handle those, like, hemiblabra and stuff without getting welts all over my hands. Interesting. Um, yeah. Getting rid of hissers would eliminate the issue. Yeah. But otherwise, you just got to live with it. And it sucks. It sucks. Yeah. Well, she also has a question. What do you think would be the best composting roach? Uh, most people say Eublabarus species ivory, and I've never tried that at composting, but I'd be inclined to agree. Hmm. Uh, just because there are some other species like uh, Pycnocellus, Pycnocellus serenalmentis, Pycnocellus nigra, that do much the same thing. There are, you know, a swarming species, burrowing species you drop anything in there and they'll turn it into roach rats. And, uh, but unlike Eublabarus, the pygno cells are pretty small. So separating them from the compost is much more difficult than with a bigger species like Eublabarus, species ivory. So okay. based on that, I would say Eublabarus species ivory is the best bladdy composting option currently available. Okay. Who knows? Maybe we'll get something new in a couple of years that is better than them. Even better. Yeah. Okay. Supreme Gecko wants to ask about protein for roaches. How much is too much protein for roaches like dubias that will be fed to reptiles? Yeah. Um, so roaches don't seem to care about the protein. You can feed them as much protein as you want. They won't eat too much to the point where they start like suffering as a result, so long 
as you offer fruits and vegetables at the same time. They will right. moderate mm -hmm. what they consume. So I okay. never pay attention to how much protein is in the food I'm feeding them. I just feed them a varied diet so that they can regulate that way. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, our, our the Pot Ambassador is saying we found a new roach to replace Russ's logo. <laughs> it does look a lot <laughs> like my frog. It's true. I think it Frank does, Dupin, yeah. It looks a lot like a uh, bumblebee dart frog. That's cool. Yeah. Wish I could get That's a cool. better picture, get a better footage of it. <laughs> well, but. this time around, the lighting is better and, and we can see it. I, part of it is just yeah. the lag. The, the lag, mm -hmm. we're, since we're doing this you know, from a phone and stuff, the, the lag is going to affect it yeah. to some degree. But, but you can yeah. see the colors, and it looks awesome. Yeah, very pretty. Uh, so um, I know you had some roaches that you got from oh, yeah. Peter. I'd love to see those, uh, too. Yeah. All right. So Peter of Bug and Cyrus Face, he uh, recently sent me these for free, which was a huge, very generous of him. But uh, let me see if I can show them up. Nope, they're not under there. Here you go, there's one. The rhinoceros roach. Macropenistia rhinoceros. Uh, I have, he sent me a pair of nymphs, which have both molted to the fifth instar in my care. And I can confirm they're both females, which cool. is great. Honestly, because females are a lot harder to find for sale than males. So, uh, yeah, all I have to do is get a male at some point. Yeah. And I'll be able to breed them. But they take about five years, three to five years to mature, depending on how warm you keep them. Mm -hmm. And they live for... Um, and they're just really cool, really easy to keep. You just give them a thin layer of coconut fiber, peat, whatever you want, um, and put dead leaves on top of that for them to feed on, because that's mostly what they eat. Mm -hmm. And that's really it. You just keep them humid, not soaking wet. Um, I let the one side of their enclosure dry out a little bit in between waterings, but not the whole thing because they can't handle drying out completely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the substrate should be very shallow for nymphs because if they molt while covered in substrate, then they will have huge molting deformities because in the wild, they live in cavernous burrows that the adults uh, construct kind of like a rodent burrow Mm -hmm. So they're not like substrate swimmers, like a lot of burrowing roaches in the hobby are. They have a proper so tunnel. If they molt while covered in loose substrate. They have huge molting deformities. Okay. So, yeah. But other than that, I mean, they're really easy, long-lived, takes a long time to breed them. They only give birth once a year. Uh and it takes uh, them how many years so, to mature? Three to five on average. And how long is their life? Uh, I think some people, yeah. Uh, the, the adults live around uh, four to five years on average. Okay. So they only have one or two I think productive seven years. Is the longest. Uh, but what did you say, sir? They, they only have a couple of years of production before they die. Uh, yeah, 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 about, you know, three, four years of production. Um, but, yeah, but they do give birth to, like, 30 nymphs per bird. So it's not too bad. But, yeah, they're really, really cool, really hard to get. Um, although they have been more commonly available in recent years. But, so it was super nice of Peter to send me this pair for free. Oh, yeah. For free. Yeah, they're, they're not 
uh, not cheap roaches. <laughs> no, no, and then a dream species of mine forever. So yeah, like now, Peter's one. Peter's pretty awesome. Gotta say it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Wally, thank you, Crystal, thank you. Uh, thanks for the congrats, everybody, on the uh, on my having 40, reached 40,000. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Congrats. But, uh, All right. Yeah, so that's so. I also did want to show off. Mm -hmm. uh, Roly poly roaches. Oh yeah, I is, wanted to see these too. This is a species a lot of people uh, want. Uh, I don't know how to do this while holding a flashlight in my other hand. <laughs> okay, like that. There we go. Should be one. There you go. So these are roly poly roaches. And I don't think I'll be able to grab this one. But when disturbed sufficiently, they will roll into balls, much like armadillidium roach uh <laughs> isopods. Very cool. And uh, is it the the in the skittish. juveniles and the females that do that and then the males mm -hmm. don't? The mature males don't. Yeah. So mature just males are winged. And so they can't really curl up like that. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to see. Where is there is another one? There. Against the side of the container. Uh, females birth very early. So I think those are some second and star babies right there. Oh, okay. And you can see a male near the container. Oh, I saw the wings. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I don't know how this is. This probably looks like a potato on the string. But on my phone, it looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is there more? There should be more hiding in there. There you go. Yeah. Freaking lighting. But, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so those yeah, are really do, cool. They do look isopod-like, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Even when they're not yeah, rolled up, they that form. Yeah. It's like an example of, like, convergent evolution because isopods and roaches, you know, they evolved completely differently of each other. But... Right. They both evolved a way to defend themselves that ended up being very similar. Right. Uh, Along with, and even the uh, way the segments curl up is different. So, oh, a different way to do it. Kind of like uh, yeah. the, the glomerus millipedes. millipedes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that they found different solutions. They found the same solution to the same problem, but did it a little differently. Yeah, it started out from a different uh, spot. Yeah, that's yeah. very cool. Oh, Arthur Pot Ambassador just said, slap Cubaris label on them and take them to the bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Uh, oh, this is very difficult to focus. Uh, oh, yeah. These uh, are cool. Uh, These yeah. are... species I'm excited to be working again. You have a pretty big bustling culture, 2018, but that's when I got rid of my collection, so I might have these back again. Yeah, those, those are And cool. the mother who exhibit a level of maternal care, uh, they tend to bore into rotten wood when mm -hmm. they're ready to gestate, uh, when they're ready to give birth soon. And mm -hmm. then they give birth within little galleries in the wood and will protect the babies, like hunch over them, and the babies will flock to the mothers and uh, hide underneath them so that it's harder for predators to get to them. That is so, cool. Pretty neat. And babies tend to stay close to adult females for the first couple months. People say that the mothers feed them secretions 
from the base of their legs. Huh. But I don't know if that's the case with this particular species of Parasphaerus. But at least some species are known to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them are arboreal metallic Parasphaerus species have been known to do that, but there are no those in culture. Wow, that would be something. Those species, yeah, those species will actually carry their babies underneath them and can curl up into balls with the baby like wrapped inside. <laughs> so that's really cool. But, but we don't have any of those in culture. Oh, that's pretty cool, though. Yeah. That would be neat if, if they come into the hobby. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, that's so that's cool. these pretty uh pretty sensitive. Probably should have isolated some for this stream, but I forgot about them till I. So yeah. Yeah, well, that's fine. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. <clears throat> you had uh you had a very good selection that you brought to to show us today, so that's Thanks. awesome. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're, um, we're coming down on uh, mm -hmm. our time a little bit. We're, I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that, uh, first of all, that you had a chance to tell everybody if they they want to check out your channel or other social media, mm -hmm. your blog, anything, where, where do they go? Um, well, my blog is invertebratedude.blogspot.com, and that is my... Uh, you know, that's where I post most of my updates about my collection and, you know, when something new happens in my collection, you know, a rare species molts to maturity or I breed something, that's where I usually go. Um, you can also, I've been pretty active on Instagram lately, uh, Invertebrate Dude, at in, you know, Instagram. Uh, I've been trying to post pretty frequently there. Uh, sometimes new updates on my collection and then sometimes just posts about old species I used to keep. Um, yeah, and uh, that's pretty much it. I, I do have a YouTube channel, Invertebrate Dude on YouTube, but uh, I'm not, I don't post videos that often there. Uh, I hope to soon, but I kind of want to better set up a camera and clip mic or something, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so primarily active on my blog and Instagram lately. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, TJ Umbrell. But again, I don't really post there that often. Um, yeah, so that's where you can find me. Awesome. And yeah, my blog, I try to also make care sheets as well uh, for the blog and, uh, you know, other resources. I try, I recently I made a bit of a key to hobby, pure hobby hissers, trying to help people figure out if their hissers are pure or not. So I do have that resource on my blog as well. So I'm trying to cool. build it up to be more of a informative resource for people. But yeah. mostly it's just me posting about my experiences keeping various invertebrates. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So Wally from Supreme mm -hmm. Gecko wants to know what is the number one species on your wish list? <sighs> my number one species is Pilema species South Addo, uh, South Africa. It is a kind of boring looking, probably to most people, uh, mm -hmm. black cylindrical cockroach that the nymphs and females spend their entire lives in neat sh burrows that they build straight into the clay of, uh, you know, the South Africa. And they, they kind of like, a, you've ever seen tiger beetle larva? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're like those. They block off the burrow entrances with their pronotums that are fit neatly to fit the width of the tunnel. And they just spend their whole lives in that tunnel, never leave it, um, unless they turn into adult males, in which case they have wings and they fly around looking for females to mate with. But they oh. just spend their entire lives straight in that hole, eating organic debris that falls next to them. It's pretty boring, honestly. Some people, not, it's literally keeping a pet hole. But the behavior is just so strange that 
you would just stay in one single burrow. It's like keeping a tiger beetle larva, but as yeah. a roach instead. Right, or kind of like a yeah. trapdoor spider that's mm -hmm. not yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 like that. Um, and so, they'll even, when, when the females are brooding, they'll widen the burrows and build a little bit of a chimney to the burrow. Um, so you can easily tell when some are about to give birth um, to accommodate the babies, which they keep in their burrow with them for a few months. That is so they're so big cool. enough to go and make their own burrow. So, so they just reach yeah. outside of the burrow and grab food with their... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and just legs. drag it down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. I guess feeding time would be really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, really interesting. It? I know, like, one breeder in Germany has them, hmm. but I don't know if they'll ever make it to the U.S. But so they I definitely want to keep them. Though. They are in captive culture right now, yes. But uh, so cool. I don't know if they'll stay. But I really hope. I've been wanting those for years. So that's my number one most wanted species. Wow. I had no idea roaches that lived in mm -hmm. that particular niche existed. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. They inhabit all sorts of different niches. It's a very, very diverse group. Um, so, you know, it, that's one of the reasons why they're so misunderstood. People just think, oh, you know, you know, they live in kitchens and trash and stuff and mostly just detritivores that live under leaf litter maybe and stuff. But they inhabit a very wide range of habitat, you know, like yeah. those, those wasp mimic roaches I showed, you know, they right. they it, are diurnal. They live mostly on foliage, visit flowers during the daytime like wasps would, you know, like they're very mm -hmm. active, you know, so. And, there's just a very wide variety of species. There are semi-aquatic species too. Um, so, very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. That is cool. I never knew there were semi-aquatic roaches as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, Vince wants to know the scientific name of the roach that lives in the clay again. Uh, Pilema. Uh, P-I-L-E-M-A. That's the genus. There are multiple okay. different species, but I just know of one that's in culture. Okay. And it's not been identified down to species yet. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that's but, so yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh. Wow. <clears throat> well, before we go, is there anything else, Tristan, that you would want to uh, say? Anything that we've missed? Uh, I think so. I think I've covered most things. Um, just, uh, you know, if I've been doing a lot of work with hissers lately, trying to identify hissers. So if, mm -hmm. you know, if anyone has doubts whether their hissers are pure or not, feel free to check out my blog. I got that key that I'm working on. And, uh, you know, uh, if anyone has any species that they're, at, you know, wondering care about, I like to answer husbandry questions as well. So feel free to contact me. Um, and I can help out with that too. That's, that's most most of what I do online is just helping people out who need care information and uh, identification help. You know, with various orders of invertebrates. So, yeah, I'm just if you need information, uh, I'm your guy. So, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Very cool. All mm -hmm. right. Well, it's been great. Um, I've learned mm -hmm. a lot and had a lot of fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank joining you. Us. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And yeah. uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be fun. Definitely. Definitely. All right. Yeah. Good already. Well, okay. Thanks again mm -hmm. for joining us, and thanks to everybody mm -hmm. for watching. Bye. Thanks, we'll Roger. See you. Later. See you.